All right, I think it's time to start. Thanks for the jokes. Um, so welcome to our session. Thank you for sticking around until the last session of the day, also walking to the you know, last part of the building. Uh, welcome to our session, The Hidden Heroes Behind AI, Making Sense of GPUs and TPUs and Kubernetes. Uh, my name is David Porter. Uh, I'm from Google. I work on the Google Kubernetes team. I work on Node. I'm also a maintainer in, in SigNode. And this is Evan. Hi, I'm Yvonne. Uh, I am with NVIDIA, as the T-search says. Uh, I'm on the Cloud Native team, and we build everything that's required to run GPUs in containers, right? So the container toolkit, if you've heard of that, the device plugin, uh, the GPU operator, all of that good stuff. Um, so, like, these kinds of devices and accelerators have been quite a hot topic at this conference already, and they're becoming increasingly important to run these complex workloads like uh, machine learning training and inference. And the demand for them has been growing over time as well. So it's even more important for us to be able to access these GPUs, TPUs, and even the FPGAs uh, in our Kubernetes um, clusters so that we can run these jobs. So in the talk today, we'll cover how Kubernetes actually integrates with these devices and sort of a little bit of a spoiler, but it's through device plugins, and how these device plugins and device allocation actually work. Uh, we'll also be looking like some usage examples of GPUs and TPUs on Kubernetes and giving some sort of thoughts, details, hints, tips on operating clusters with TPU, TPUs and GPUs and a sort of a brief outlook on what we see as the future of devices in Kubernetes. Now, first of all, what is a device? Well, essentially, it's this thing here, right? But that's not very useful. Um, so a device with a capital D uh, or resource is something that a user wants access to for a specific purpose, such as training a machine learning model. Um, and, but why don't you sort of like go down the various levels of abstraction or up through the various levels of abstraction, I suppose? Uh, you end up with a collection of device nodes, libraries, and utilities that are required to actually access the device in an, in an environment such as a container. And in Kubernetes, these are exposed as countable extended resources, which can then be requested by a user. And in order to do this, one requires a per node device plugin. So these device plugins register with a kubelet and sort of under a specific name, such as nvidia.com slash GPU, which I'm sure some of you have already seen. Um, and this device plugin then lists the devices available as a set of opaque IDs um, and may be able to provide specific hints to the kubelet in order to allocate these devices. Once an allocation of this device takes place, um, the device plugin then can provide information about modifications that need to be made to the container spec as it's being created. So this includes device nodes, mounts, environment variables, annotations, and something new. Um, there's an alpha feature in 128 and should promote to, uh, should uh, be promoted to beta in 129 is the inclusion of specifying CDI device names. And sort of these CDI devices, so the CDI or container device interface is a CNCF sponsored project under tag runtime and provides a, a way for vendors to declaratively specify what a device means, right? Capital D device. This includes device nodes, mounts, environment variables, hooks, um, and tries to be for devices what the OCI runtime spec is for containers. And then uh, these devices or these modifications associated with a device, capital D device, map to OCI runtime spec modifications. And once these modifications are made, then you should be able to have access to your device. Now, these devices also can be referred to by a locally unique name and a fully qualified CDI device name, which includes a vendor component, a class component, and a name. Um, and another thing to note is that the CRI was extended to include support for CDI device fields in the 027 release. Now, just in terms of CDI and how it would work, right? First of all, like we as vendors would probably generate CDI, well, would generate CDI spec using some vendor tooling. Maybe that should be vendor one, vendor two, vendor three. Um, and this tooling could be run uh, sort of once off. Uh, this could be seen as a static config. If you know everything about your devices a priori, then you could generate the specification, uh, put it on your, on your node somewhere, and then that can be available for things that need it. Uh, this could also be generated dynamically if you're busy trying to do something a bit more interesting. Sort of in terms of how they're consumed, a container runtime will receive some request by the CRI to create a container. The CRI request could include the CDI devices in the field, in the spec, or possibly as annotations, which were used before the, the field in the spec were added. Um, Having selected a device, the container runtime, such as Cryo or Container D, which both support CDI natively, reads the CDI specifications, 
that were generated previously by the vendor tooling um, for the selected devices, applies the modifications defined by the CDI spec to the OCI uh, runtime specification, and then sort of invokes run C as normal. Run C would then read this OCI spec, which now includes the modifications, and uh, start the container or create the container using that specification. Because it includes these modifications, that container that was created has access to the devices as required. Now, we're going to zoom out a bit, and for that, I'm going to hand over back to David. Cool. So now that we can understand what's going on maybe at the low level, let's zoom out to understand how this fits into kind of the whole Kubernetes ecosystem, right? So we have all these components running here. So where does it start? It starts with the actual device, right? So in this example, we have two GPUs. And, you know, you need to set up a node, you need to get that hardware on there, and you need to install the drivers, right? We're talking about the actual, like, kernel drivers that can interface with the actual device. So once we have that, um, the first thing is we need to deploy a device plugin, right? The device plugin is a component that the vendor builds that basically is the proxy between the kubelet and the actual device. So in this case, you know, you deploy the, the NVIDIA device plugin uh, that knows how to talk to these GPUs. And the device plugin's job is basically to communicate with the kubelet and uh, the actual GPUs to advertise them, right? So the device plugin starts up, it talks to the GPUs, it says, hey, I have two GPUs, and then it talks to kubelet. So kubelet then actually, you know, makes these calls to the device plugin, and then it actually updates the node capacity to the API server, right? So the nodes already have, you know, some capacity for CPU and memory. And then now uh, the device plugin will also tell the kubelet, I also have, you know, nvidia.com slash GPU2, whatever that means. And so the kubelet and, you know, the other components in the ecosystem, they usually don't understand what nvidia.com GPU is. It's just an extended resource, right? It's a name and then it's some count of them. And that's what we mean by um, an extended resource type, right? So the API server now knows that, you know, this node has this much of this resource. And now the other actors in the system, right, can call out to the API server and be made aware of this, right? So the next step, a user comes in, right, and deploys a, uh, a pod. Um, and the pod comes in, and in the pod spec, you have some number of requests, right? So you're already requesting CPU and memory, and then you also add the request, and you put the same uh, extended resource name, and you say how many you want, right? NVIDIA.com slash GPU1. You put that in your container spec. And then from there, uh, you submit that pod, it goes up to the scheduler, and the scheduler, since it knows around uh, nodes from all the other nodes, uh, the node capacity, right, it, it can figure out which node has that resource available and schedules uh, the pod to a, a node that is suitable for it. So once that happens, uh, you know, the scheduling takes place. And the next step is you have Kubla here, right? And Kubla is actually seeing the, the pod. And it, it kind of does two things. The first thing it does is it actually talks to the device plugin. And we'll go in a little more detail in a bit. And then also it talks to the container runtime to actually start uh, that pod. So it talks to the device plugin. It'll basically allocate a device uh, for this pod. And then the device plugin will come back with some information. And then the Kubla will talk to the container runtime. And it'll basically. Uh, pass back to the container runtime some extra information on how to make this device actually accessible by the workload. Uh, from there, the container runtime talks to run C. Run C is the, is the low-level library there, right? The low-level component that actually goes ahead and creates the actual container. And it'll have in the specification there the actual access to, you know, the device mounts, libraries, and other config to make sure that the workload can actually access that device. And then in some cases, there's some vendor magic here that is at either maybe at the container runtime level or run C level that also does a little bit of work to inject uh, some stuff uh, in some layer of the stack here. Uh, but that's kind of vendor specific. And then at the last step here, run C will go ahead and create the, the workload, right? It'll create the, the process that needs access to that device. And then when the workload actually starts up, right, it can just talk to the device directly. It doesn't talk to the device plugin or anything else here. It just has direct access to the device. So that's kind of the overall workflow of how a pod uh, can get access to a device and how the device plugin advertises those devices. So one of the critical elements here is the device plugin. So we want to spend a little bit more time going into the device plugin, like how does it actually work, right? What are the steps in it? So the first step is device registration. Device registration is the process where the device plugin starts up and actually discovers what devices are running there. So to back up for a second, the device plugin you deploy usually as a, as a daemon set in your cluster, but it can, it's just an arbitrary process that runs uh, on your node, right? And it communicates to the kubelet. How does it do the communication? Uh, there's a well-defined kind of device protocol, um, and it talks over gRPC. So it talks to the kubelet. There's a Unix uh, domain socket, right, that it can talk to and, and uh, communicate over gRPC. So device plugin starts up, right? It talks to, it basically connects to kubelet and it says, hey, I'm going to register. 
and I have this API resource type, right? And then I have this uh, resource, right? This is where the nvidia.com slash GPU actually comes from, right? The device plugin tells Kubelet I have this device available. Uh, from there, uh, the Kubelet goes ahead and talks to the device plugin. It basically says, what are the device plugin options? Uh, this is some extra kind of information that the Kubelet can obtain, like, for example, uh, should the uh, should the device plugin be aware uh, before a container starts? It can also provide some hints around like allocation. So, for example, for some topology aware uh, scheduling, it can provide some hints there. And then the last call is this list and watch. The list and watch is a gRPC like streaming call. So, what that means is Kubelet makes this call and it keeps that uh, connection open. And the whole point of this call is to return the actual devices. So, in this call, you'll get back the two devices, right? GPU 0 and GPU 1 and a health status for each one. Healthy equals true for both. And the reason this is a long-lived streaming gRPC connection is because the devices can go unhealthy, right? If a device goes unhealthy, the Kubelet wants to be made aware of that. And if the device goes unhealthy, it'll talk to the API server, it'll update its capacity, you know, it might update NVIDIA.com GPU from two to one, and if a pod is actively using that GPU, uh, or that device, uh, the Kubelet will fail that pod and make sure that a new pod can get created uh, to make sure that, you know, if, if, uh, if another controller is managing that pod, you know, new pod can get created that, that will uh, cont continue the work needed. So that's the registration phase. That's how the Kubelet and the device plugin kind of orchestrate the, the initial phase. So what's the next step? The next step is when an actual workload comes in, and we need to give that workload access to a specific device. So this is the device allocation phase. Uh, it's important to note here, actually, Kubelet's the one that's responsible for figuring out which device to give to the workload, right? So the Kubelet starts up, and it basically knows that, you know, it has these devices available, and it can pick, you know, GP1 to give to that workload. Uh, the device plugin can kind of influence that decision uh, by giving some hints uh, to the Kubelet, but ultimately it's Kubelet's responsibility here to figure out what device. So Kubelet comes in and says, I want you to allocate GP1 for this pod, for this, for this workload, right? And then the device plugin responds with basically this, these list of fields, right? And these fields are basically what, uh, con what changes need to be made to the container spec to ensure that the workload can actually access the device. So these are things like modifying, for example, some environment variables that are in the device, adding some mounts, uh, adding some, some device mounts, annotations, and lastly, kind of the CDI devices, uh, which were mentioned earlier, right? It can actually add that. Uh, and then Kubelet later will take this whole information, apply these kind of patches to the container, uh, and then give it to the container runtime to actually start. And then the last step of the process here is actually starting the, the, the workload, right? So Kubelet will actually start the, the container, and right before it starts, it'll talk to the device plugin, it'll say, I'm gonna start uh, this workload with this device, and uh, the device plugin can do something like, for example, you know, making initializing the device, whatever it needs to do uh, to make that device ready to be consumed. So after this, the workload is started, and everything's great, the, the pod can, can use that device. So, we want to now kind of step back for a second and take a look at what are some of the other devices that exist and how do they also make use of device plugin and kind of the Kubernetes ecosystem. So I want to introduce TPUs for you for a second. So TPUs are a special built accelerator for inference and training by Google. Uh, they're optimized uh, for training and inference of large AI models like, you know, your LMs that are so popular these days and gen AI models and other image models and so forth. And there's two flavors of, of TPUs that exist. We have uh, TPU devices and TPU slices. So TPU devices are these independent devices. So the whole idea here is that they're not interconnected to other TPUs, it's just one device that one workload uses, kind of like a GPU. And then TPU slices are also an interesting uh, kind of different flavor of TPU. Um, that are basically groups of TPUs. So there are multiple different TPUs on different machines, all interconnected uh, with this very high-speed interconnect, and that allows to get very good performance out of them. And so um, these, t these TPUs you can use like kind of existing ML frameworks, PyTorch and, and JAX and TensorFlow and so forth uh, to be able to, to write workloads against them, right? But the interesting thing here is like how does Kubernetes play into this? How does device plugin work into this, right? So let's look at that. So first of all, why do we even need Kubernetes to manage TPUs, right? Um, I think that is the answer for any of these workloads, but especially for TPUs because you have so many of them. Uh, you, they're run running across many different machines, and you need something that'll orchestrate uh, all these workloads, scheduling them in the right place, monitoring the health of them, and uh, making sure they run, right? So that's where Kubernetes comes in helpful. Now, how did we actually integrate with this with TPU? We built a TPU device plugin, uh, just like any other device plugin, that exposes the TPUs as a resource type. And we call it google.com slash TPU, and you put there how many TPU chips you want access in your workload. Now, scheduling is kind of an interesting thing to talk about when it comes to TPUs. So for TPU devices, it's pretty simple, right? It's just like a one-to-one -one mapping. So you have one TPU device, you have a pod, you have a container, it uses X amount of like TPUs there. It's pretty simple. Uh, TPU slices are a little bit more interesting because 
uh, since they're spread across multiple different machines, you need to figure out how do you schedule a, a multiple different replicas of your, of your workload, how do they all kind of intercommunicate, and how do, you all set, how do you set that up? It's kind of like a gain scheduling type of problem in the sense of you need to schedule multiple replicas, they all need to talk to each other, uh, and they all need to be up to ensure that your job continues. So how do we use the, the Kubernetes kind of primitives to make that actually work? Um, here's kind of an example how you would set that up and kind of what we recommend. So like, the first step here is you set up a service. You set up a headless service, and the reason we need to do this is because we want each of those replicas uh, to be able to have a DNS name, because all of those replicas are gonna have to talk to all the other replicas to, to actually do work here, right? And since we have to set up multiple replicas, we're gonna use the a Kubernetes job to represent this, right? So here we're setting up like a pod slice job. We're gonna use like an index job. And here we set the node selector. We're gonna use like a special version of TPU. They come in different kind of topologies and so forth. We pick this topology. And uh, because it has this number of this topology, we have a certain number of chips per node. Uh, if you do the math here, you get like four, uh, you end up actually with four different nodes, and we wanna schedule a pod on all those nodes, right? So that's why we set completions and parallelism to four there. Uh, then you set up some environment variables, and then you set up your TPU worker host names. So these are actually like the DNS entries, right? Like how the, TPU software will be able to find all the other TPUs that are out there, right? Because you have multiple of them, they all need to intercommunicate. So th that's where we specify the, the DNS entries there. Uh, then we actually have your workload. This workload is like installing the libtpu software, it's just doing like the hello world, printing how many TPU cores there are. And then finally, you set your requests, right? And this is where we set that google.com TPU4. This is where the device plugin, the scheduler, will actually see access to that device. So this is kind of how you would set up a workload uh, for, for TPU pod slices, right? Using all these existing Kubernetes primitives. So I want to give you like a quick demo of how this works. Um, in this demo, what we're doing is we're doing inference. So there's like this chat uh, GPTJ model. We're using this inference server called SaxML, and we're kind of trying to run this. So uh, I'll give you kind of a quick look at this. So we start by setting up a Kubernetes GKE cluster, um, just a standard cluster, uh, no TPUs yet. And then the next step is we create a node pool. We are using V5E uh, TPUs. So you just specify kind of the machine type there. Uh, we have those TPUs there now. And then now we're gonna set up, actually we're gonna use a gateway for this because we wanna have an inference server. So we're setting up um, like a subnet and some of the other kind of networking things needed here. So now we're getting the Kubernetes credentials so we can use kubectl. So we have one TPU machine here running here, right? Uh, GK TPU. And now we're gonna deploy all the workloads here, all the, all the YAML manifests. Uh, the SACS model is kind of what I showed you earlier. It's kind of like that job configuration. And uh, SACS is like that inference server. So it's gonna actually start up and uh, create like an endpoint that we can do inference request against, right? Um, so we're gonna wait for um, everything to start up here. Uh, when the inference server starts, it downloads the model from a GCS bucket. And now we're gonna try to make some queries against it, right? So we have the IP for it, because it's behind a service. Uh, so we're gonna get the IP for it. And we're gonna try to actually make some uh, inference requests. So first we're gonna ask basically like, what is the model that's loaded? And you can see here's the GPTJ model. So you can see we're running one replica. Um, and then from here, we're gonna actually make a re request, right? So here's your LLM uh, query, right? It actually is like a summarization thing here. So it asks, it gives a news article and asks to summarize it. So that's the prompt. Um, and then now we're gonna actually do the inference call. And so we do the inference call and we get all the responses and, and summaries. So it's all done uh, on TPUs. And so we have our, our, uh, our response there. And then now, um, kind of what's the benefit of running this in Kubernetes, right? In, in, in GK and Kubernetes. So one is the auto scaling, right? So or, uh, in the first step, we actually set up an HPA, right? And so this will work regardless of any device you have, right? GPUs, TPUs, whatever it might be. And so now we're gonna actually set up like a load test. We're gonna uh, send a whole bunch of calls to that inference server. And uh, the HPA is gonna see it. It's gonna spin up more pods. It's gonna have to scale up. Because uh, there's not enough uh, capacity, uh, the cluster autoscaler is gonna see that. And it's actually gonna provision another node. So you can see here on the UI, it started to update and increase uh, and, and basically provision a new node. And a new node is gonna start up here. And uh, it's gonna be able to schedule an, another pod uh, to handle this increased uh, load. So you can see here the second uh, node started here. So we have two nodes now. And then we can look at the pods. A new pod was created, it's creating, it's already scheduled. And so now, now it's gonna be able to withstand that, that increased load. And so um, that's kind of the power of like, you know, just using Kubernetes and existing primitives that, that exist in Kubernetes uh, to, to run these type of workloads. And so uh, 
also, right, all these workloads and all, all these uh, inference chips, right, they're, they're all pretty expensive, right, and so cost, cost optimization is, 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 is really important. So you want to scale down when you're not using them. And so that's going to happen right now. It's going to see that we're not actually making use, uh, there's no more load. It's going to scale down uh, the deployment. And as a result, it's going to delete those pods. And then the cluster autoscaler is going to see that the node's not being util utilized. It's going to delete that node. And we're back to uh, where we started with a single uh, TPU node. So uh, making sure we don't need extra resources uh, if we don't need them. So that's kind of the demo, um, just to give you kind of a taste of how, how this kind of all fits together. Cool. All right. Oops. All right. So now that you kind of saw some of, the, some of the ideas of how you can use it with a real device and how it works underneath, we kind of wanted to give you some tips from an operator standpoint, right? Like, as an operator, what do you need to be aware of when you're setting up these type of devices, right? So the first step is you need to actually create a cluster and provision the nodes with the right resources, right? So with a cloud provider, that might be as simple as creating a node pool with the, the devices you need. Um, maybe it's actually getting the devices. That's kind of up to you to figure out. And then once you have that, you need to actually set up those so set up those devices, right? So install the drivers and the device plugins. So on cloud providers, this is usually kind of pretty easy and built in. And then NVIDIA has this NVIDIA GPU operator, uh, which is a kind of collection of components that actually does this for you. It'll on uh, common OSs and so forth. It'll install the drivers and the, and the right device plugin and all the components needed to set this up. So what, what do you do after that? Uh, the next step is once you have a cluster full of these devices and, and nodes with these devices, you need to label them. And the reason for that is because you might have a cluster with a lot of different nodes with different capabilities, uh, with GPUs, TPUs, different models, et cetera, right? And it's important to remember that with a device plugin, you have like the, the resource type is nvidia.com slash GPU, right? And that's regardless of what type of GPU you have, right? So if you have like a A100 or a T4 or whatever GPU you might have, they're all advertised the same way. So you need node labeling uh, to ensure that the right workloads get to the right uh, devices. So you have to label your nodes based on the resources they contain. Some cloud providers do this automatically. And NVIDIA has, for example, a project called the GPU Feature Discovery, which does this automatically, right? They'll figure out what GPUs are on there, label the nodes uh, with, with the device name. Now, another problem is, right, since these accelerators are really expensive, you don't want to run workloads that don't need those devices on uh, GPU nodes, right? And that's why our, uh, node taining comes in. So if you taint the nodes with accelerators, by default, a workload that comes in, right, it won't be scheduled to those nodes unless it explicitly has tolerations, right? And that's something probably you want because you don't want random, you know, web servers or things that don't need GPUs or TPUs or whatever device you have landing on those nodes. Then the last step here, right, you want to schedule your actual workloads, and you probably want to use a combination of node affinity based on the node labels that you set earlier, the, t the tolerations for the taints, and also the requests, right, uh, for, the, for whatever device plugin resource name uh, you want to use. And then lastly, right, uh, for GPUs and other devices, right, utilization is super important because these are expensive resources, right? So there's different resource sharing schemes on basically how do you, s how do you have a whole GPU, how do you split it up into smaller pieces, uh, smaller chunks that to allow multiple pods and multiple different workloads to make use of them. And th there's some technologies like MIG, time slicing, NVIDIA MPS, they can find some more information about uh, that, that provide that ability. And so, Lastly, right, um, when you're running these type of workloads, you want to monitor them to make sure that, you know, they're performing well and, and uh, they're working as expected. So some cloud providers have built-in metrics for this. Like on GK, for example, we have like a GK metric here, duty cycle, that tells you how much uh, your GP was busy during some period. And we have like a TPU metric, right? It's tensor core utilization that basically provides an analogous for TPUs. And if you want some more advanced metrics, uh, NVIDIA has a project called uh, the D DCGM exporter. It's a Prometheus exporter that provides uh, super detailed information around GPUs. Um, and also integrates with the Kubelet Pod Resources API, so you can actually get a per pod level metric. So you can understand, you know, how much was this pod utilizing the GPU versus this pod and so forth. So that's kind of the accelerator monitoring. So I want to hand it back to, to Evan to talk a little bit about the future, uh, where we see devices going in Kubernetes. Cool. Hi, thanks, David. Um, yeah, so one of the things we're particularly excited about is dynamic resource allocation. Now, this is a, a new way to request resources that's been available as an alpha feature since uh, Kubernetes 126. And it's an alternative to this counting-based interface that the device plugin provides, right? So um, instead of only being able to uh, select sort of whole numbered integer sort of units of devices, it, it puts full control of the API to request these resources in the hands of third-party developers. Now, third-party in this case generally means device vendors, so third-party in the context of Kubernetes. Um, and here, sort of, we, we map entry API objects to, to vendor-specific APIs that allow for that extensibility. I'm not going to go into the details. There are talks and stuff about that. 
Um, and, and this DRA uses CDI behind the scenes to once a CDI spec is available for a particular device, probably being dynamically generated, is passed to the container runtime. Now, one of the reasons, or some of the reasons, we're very excited about DRA is that it enables a lot of different functionality that is not really possible in the device plugin at the moment. Um, <clears throat> uh, because you're no longer uh, tied to the single countable resource name, uh, it supports multiple device types per node. So you can have a heterogene heterogeneous node and allow uh, workloads to be targeted at specific devices. Um, because remember that these node labels that you're able to use are node specific and are not di device specific. It also allows for explicit sharing of these devices across containers and pods. The device plugin as it exists uh, is any device request is for a specific container. And there's no way to explicitly share that device across various containers or pods. So if you're running a more um, exciting distributed um, ML application, for example, you may want to share a device across those different pods or containers. You're also able to select resources based on constraints. Um, such as available memory, uh, as sort of resource capabilities, CUDA device, uh, sort of the CUDA version, et cetera, right? Um, and you know, those could be done with labels to some extent, but once again, those are not uh, device specific, they're node specific. It also allows for dynamic provisioning of resources. So uh, David mentioned MIG and that you basically take a, a full GPU and slice it up into hardware slices. And uh, DRA allows you to do that dynamically. So a request comes in requesting a particular uh, sort of type of GPU or slice of a GPU, and it can dynamically allocate that uh, MIG slice on a MIG-enabled GPU and provide that to the pod or container that's busy requesting it. It also provides better support for enhanced features like MPS. So MPS is something that requires an additional process to be started to allow uh, clients to access a device, and DRA sort of in our DRA driver that we have implemented, you're able to start this um, MPS daemon as, as part of that process, so you don't have to worry about that as a user. Now, because of all this extra control, uh, you also are able to right-size your device request for the application that you're trying to get, that, that you're trying to use, right? So if you're just doing some lightweight uh, sort of iterative development in some notebook, you might be able to select a smaller device than if you're trying to run inference or training for a large ML model. And one thing to note is uh, sort of the caveat here is that because of this flexibility, um, there are some implications with regarding to uh, integration with the scheduler and autoscaler. And so there's on ongoing discussions in the communi community around that. Um, so there's still some problems to solve before we we're at the point where we can say that this is going GA or, yeah. So I think this is where there's a call to action, right? Um, from the community, we need uh, input on what problems you're currently having with using accelerators. And is there anything, like what's limiting your current use of the existing device plugin model? Right? This will allow us to get more information as to whether or not the APIs that we're busy exposing in DRA as it is designed is, are the right APIs or what use cases are important to design for. So yeah, I think uh, provide some links in the slides, but at this point, we can open for questions. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you for the nice talk. Uh, listening to your excellent explanation of the process by which a GPU is discovered and made available in Kubernetes, I went back years in my, in my memories and I was thinking of extended and expanded RAM, if, if, you have a, if you were born in those times. But at certain point, computers had different types of additional RAM and we needed drivers or ways to discover it and make it available to the operating system. And I was thinking today, when I request uh, RAM, I just say how much, and when I request the CPU, I just say what fraction of a CPU I want. And I was thinking, would it not be nice to have the same for the GPU? How, how much GPU memory I need for my container and, and how much GPU, what fraction of the GPU I want to use? So my question to you is, are you aware of any movement in, in Kubernetes in this direction to, to make access to the GPUs 
uniform, transparent, or, or easy, let's say, which answers your last question, what kind of problems we see using our accelerators. Thank you. Do you want to answer first, or? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, like, in, in general, I think that's actually, what, what you mentioned is, is that ability to, you know, we see devices in the device plugin as kind of static today, right? I think that's the big thing that, that you're talking about, is you want to basically request a device that needs to repartition on the fly, right, with maybe some more memory or something like that. And then there's a whole question around other devices which are kind of network attached and you can attach on the fly, maybe like some other device or you can add, add something else. So I think that's actually one of the limitations in the device plugin model today, right? It doesn't have a good, very good flexibility for these devices changing on the fly. And DRA is one, one, one uh, approach to solve that problem and we're, we're kind of looking into that approach because we see more and more devices with these type of needs. Yeah, I think um, maybe the there, there's definitely as if we get to a point where that's an API that we can expose, there there is still vendor specific logic behind that, right? Because not all devices are fractionally addressable, right? Where where memory is, CPU is to to some extent. So I think that's part of what DRA also tries to address is allow that flexibility to in the background enable things like MPS, um, like MIG to allow fractional sort of, um, sort of access to a, to a certain degree. Sharing is, is what you end up be having, yeah. Thank Thanks. You. Hello, yeah, great presentation, uh, thank you. So uh, I have a question about the DR, DRA there. Uh, it's kind of a future, maybe a future. So uh, there's one, you said it could support a different type of uh, device in same node, that's, that's fantastic. I'm wondering like, uh, even if it could support uh, a dynamic resource allocation, but uh, does it also support a dynamic resource assignment to different task job there, or it still needed to be pre-configured for them? Do, or do you have a discussion about that? Sorry, what do you mean by dynamic assignment? Uh, uh, so when, when comes a job task here, like uh, the, the scheduler could uh, find the best uh, uh, device and assign to it? Like uh, that, that kind of thing dynamically. So, um, so, so the definition of best is uh, something that is probably vendor specific as well to a large extent, and that's where the selection of devices based on um, some criteria uh, come into play, right? So, the, the because we have this flexible API, well, the the implementation that we have, sort of uh, the early implementation we have, allows you to say, I want a device that has this CUDA compute compatibility, at least this CUDA compute, compa CUDA compute comp capability, and compatibility, uh, at least this much memory, and like you can extend that, that API okay, yeah. as well. So, so that is then, if, if there are A100s in your, in, your, in your system and they meet that specification, then like okay. they are selected. If T4s meet that sort of specification, um, they are selected. I think Kevin gave a talk, a virtual talk yesterday, uh, where he demonstrates that that flexibility in terms of device selection. So as a user, you can select that. So you have to give the scheduler that information. Pre and with that information, the scheduler can then select the node where that device is, and then that device is the one that is associated with that request. OK, got yeah. it. So it, it's kind of still using the pre-configured YAML there to, us, to already set, to put a, the kind of a resource pool there, right? So. Yes, so the, the user has to specify that up front. Okay. But one can, so DRA is also an API that you can build tools on top of. So, yeah, yeah, so yeah. some queue or, or, or something, insert hand, hand wavy here, uh, can analyze a job, understand what that mapping is, and convert that to a DRA request. And that's actually what um, our Triton management server does, and we have a demo including that, where on the, AP, the user, the UX side, you're exposing some other concept, like I want an inference GPU. And Triton API server, well, Triton management server, like converts that to some equivalent DRA request. So it's not happening in Kubernetes because it's maybe more domain specific. Yes. But it, it provides that flexibility. Okay, got yeah. it. Cool. Thanks. Sure. Um, so I have a more of an understanding question. So um, in this setup, when there is, uh, let's say, one GPU or resource or TPU on a node. Uh, can multiple pods use the resource at the same time simultaneously, or do they have to like context switch out and take turns right now? Yeah, or, I mean, yeah so I think it, it, right now, the way the device plugin model works is once that device is allocated uh, to, to a workload, no other workload can use that 
uh, device, right? And so some, some folks have kind of come up with workarounds where, for example, they advertise multiple devices in the device plugin model. Uh, and underneath, that's actually the same device, but it's advertised with different names, right? And then multiple workloads can use it, right? But that's actually one of the problems we're trying to solve, and we see as like kind of one of the gaps in the device plugin model today, right? It doesn't really have good sharing uh, between different devices, right? And that's DRA is trying to solve that problem as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. So there is. Um, the current our device plugin implementation and the one at GKE does support time slicing, um, so it's, but that's just over subscription. But you as a user have no control of which device is actually selected in the end. So it could be that you end up on a device that already has other processes running, and there's also not the same um, memory isolation guarantees that you may may have with something like MPS. Like there's isolation, you can't read another process's memory, but if that process uses all the memory, then you could, um, for example. Okay. Right on on the device level, so there is some support for it, but it's more of a, a workaround at the moment. Gotcha. Yeah. So will there be a, like a dedicated uh, hardware-based support for that? Like you know, uh, CPUs have this virtualization technology for that, right? Like, would there be a future support for something like that? Like splitting uh, existing hardware resources? So I mean, you you also have in terms of hardware support, you have something like MIG, which is hardware-level partitioning of a larger device. And what we have there is you expose each one of those slices, those hardware slices, as a separate device. And you can also layer time slicing or MPS on top of that. So you're able to use like the various sharing mechanisms in combination and sort of select something that, that works for you. So it's a multi-level sort of sharing problem there. Okay. I don't know if that answers your question. There are um, some in the links I provided uh, is one of them is regarding um, sharing in Kubernetes of our existing device plugin. And so you can have a look there, and maybe that answers some of your questions further. OK, sounds okay. good. Thank you. Cool, thanks. Uh, thanks for, uh, for the great uh, talk. And I have a question about the uh, DRA. Uh, what's the largest broker for making it a uh, GA? So, sorry, I uh, didn't... What's the largest broker for making it a GA? For DRA? Um, the largest blocker. The largest blo I think so. <laughs> There's a little thing called the scheduler and the autoscaler. Um, no, um, so, so the, the current implementation, uh, it communicates with the scheduler through the API server, and that adds quite a bit of scheduling overhead. And because the scheduler is sequential for a large part of its sort of like scheduling process, uh, things that take long there ends up blocking all other pods that should be scheduled, right? So even if those are not using claims that are associated with devices. I think that's a sort of a, a rough summary. Kevin, Kevin can add more context there um, at the front, but sort of the rough summary is that it slows down scheduling because of the communication between the controller component of your DRA driver and the scheduler. And the other uh, issue is that for, on the autoscaling side, because we have this flexibility in the API, um, the autoscaler doesn't have all the information it needs to perform the simulations it needs to perform to know which resources to, to nodes to scale up. So there needs to be some API defined between the autoscaler and the device driver or the controller of the, of the devices to, know, to, to get that information. And because that will also introduce latency, Hi. Okay. Yeah. Um, because you're introducing latency there, and the autoscaler does like I think an order of magnitude more computations and communications with that driver. Like the concern is that that's going to slow things down, and autoscaling is not going to be responsive. So those are like the two main main blockers at the moment. So one is for the port scheduling, and the other is for autoscaling, right? Yes. I see. Uh, do we have a benchmark for it? Uh, what's the current number? Like how many ports we can schedule in one second? Uh, I don't have that information. I think Patrick has done benchmarks. So Patrick Orley from Intel is the one that's been driving the sort of the DRA cap. Um, and he's done benchmarking, uh, but I don't have numbers on that or what the target is. So maybe sure. ask him. Uh, there's a DRA dev like at on the, on the Kubernetes Slack channels. Mm -hmm. So you can just ask there. Thank you. Or, or, and, and yeah, so I think uh, sort of part of the discussions that came out of this conference is that we're going to at least start an informal working group to start with, uh, with interested parties from um, scheduler, from autoscaler, and the DRA 
sort of developers to try and sort of address at least understand these problems a bit better and then start addressing them and see what's required to to move forward. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Sure. Cool. So this is a question for for David. I was looking at your slides and you showed there's different types of TPUs that you can allocate. Mm -hmm. So have you considered allocating, have you, do you consider um, TPUs as a possible use case for dynamically, for, for your DRA, for dynamically allocating different types of TPUs based on workloads? Yeah, yeah, it's actually a really good question and something something we looked into. Um, so right now, the way it works, right? I think when we looked at DRA, DRA is really good when the devices uh, can change, right? So you can with with GPUs, you can use MIG, you can split them up, and so forth, right? With TPUs today, uh, when you bring up a TPU machine with some certain topology, that topology doesn't change over the course of the lifetime of that node, right? And so since the de since the device itself is pretty static, it actually fits pretty well in the device plugin model, right? But that's the current state with, with TPUs. So if things change, um, maybe it, the DRA approach or something that's more dynamic where devices can repartition uh, will be more useful for it. Yeah, sorry. The question is, does your NVIDIA operator or the device plugin can do those slicing, time slicing, MIG and MPS, or I have to go for a special tool? No, so yeah, the, the device plugins uh, do support that. Oh, okay. Uh, Thank you. Ways to, to configure the device plugin in your workload uh, to make use of MPS and, and Oh, okay. Software. All right. Thank you. Hey, apologies if this question has already been asked, but is there thoughts on enabling C groups for DRA, so can I have like a pod with guaranteed QoS and maybe a best effort one and have like C group sort of enforcement across the two with DRA? Um, I know that there's a discussion around um, QoS classes, uh, which is somewhat related to DRA, but I don't think that DRA is trying to solve that problem necessarily. So I, I, I don't have the right answers there, but I think reach out to someone like Alexander Konevsky from Intel. Um, he might have a better response. Thanks. Sorry, sorry, maybe David has more input there. Just, just one thing to add. I think with the C groups today, right, like um, the C groups are built into the kernel, right, and they have like the devices like CPU and memory and those things are all very uniform, right? So it's very easy to make one implementation that works for them. But when you have these devices that all have like different properties and so forth, it's hard to make a C group controller for them, right? So that's why we have like these vendor specific things. But there are like maybe certain things that we can look at, maybe like that all devices have, right? That, that C groups can help with, right? So some, something interesting to look at for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you.